Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 18th of November 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So a couple of big announcements out of consensus over the last 24 hours. So first one is that they have closed a $200 million raise at a $3.2 billion valuation. Now, this raise had participation from a bunch of big name VCs and others, including HSBC, Coinbase Ventures, and Marshall Waste here. So uh, in addition to this, uh, I think consensus wants to hire another 400 employees to continue operations in Asia. Um, and yeah, I mean, all of you know, consensus right they are a long time ethereum kind of like core i guess it's not kind of like a part of the the as i was explaining yesterday kind of consensus was spun out when joe lubin kind of like left the uh the ethereum foundation or i don't even know if it was ever part of it he basically just like he was a co-founder of ethereum but he kind of like left to start consensus and consensus has been responsible for you know many of the most popular apps that we all uh, apps and kind of like services that we all use like metamask of course and truffle suite for developers and, and all those sorts of things like that uh so yeah great to see this raise come in for them I I didn't think the valuation was a little bit low considering the products that consensus has under them, uh, especially MetaMask. MetaMask alone should be worth this. And I'll explain why in a sec. But then you have Infura, you have Truffle Suite, you have like, um, I mean, there's so many projects that consensus has under their, uh, uh, under their kind of like wing. They have tokens in all different types of projects. So it definitely did come in a kind of like a lower valuation than I would have thought. But you know, it is what it is. Who knows? You know, who knows if even MetaMask is gonna is gonna tokenize anytime soon. I'm I'm still suspecting they will, and it's gonna be funny to see the MetaMask token be worth more than consensus itself because I think it will be. Like for example, I mean, if ANS can be worth what is it right now, five billion dollars fully diluted valuation. MetaMask easy, right? MetaMask is something that everyone uses and everyone uses it very regularly. It's got probably, um, uh, you know, out of just like, not even just within Ethereum, but with crypto more broadly, it is probably the most well-known product, like on-chain product in existence right now. Everyone's used it. Everyone, you know, a lot of people continue to use it. I mean, I use it all the time um, and it's been kind of like a handy tool for years in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, but yeah, I guess like on that note as well, when it comes to MetaMask, this is the second massive announcement, I guess like out of consensus, is that MetaMask now has 21 million monthly active users. That's crazy, right? This is amazing. I mean, you know, as I've explained before, MetaMask isn't just uh, kind of like an Ethereum wallet. You can add any EVM compatible network to your MetaMask RPC. So you can add like Arbitrum and Optimism. And of course, it's all those EVM side chains like BSC. Uh, you have Phantom, Avalanche, all these other ones. Obviously, the Polygon POS chain has been very popular. So you take all that together and that's what you get because there really isn't any other wallet, uh, I guess like desktop browser wallets right now that uh, kind of match up to MetaMask in terms of like brand awareness, in terms of functionality and utility. And I know MetaMask is missing a lot of features that everyone would want, but it doesn't matter. Like the pe what people want right now, and I was actually, I made a comment about this in the Daily Great Discord channel. I think the kind of like people saying, oh, we need better UX to onboard people is kind of like completely overblown because if you are offering to give people money through incentive programs, they're going to jump through so many hoops. It's not even funny. Like they're going to jump through every hoop imaginable. If they if they see easy money and and kind of like they need to jump through these these hoops to get it, such as like liquidity mining, yield farming, especially on the cheaper chains. Like obviously not on Ethereum layer one, but on these kind of like cheaper chains or, or the L twos, um, these people are going to jump through the hoops to, to get to that. And I think that obviously for mass mass adoption, we do need to simplify the UX a lot more. But at the same time, I don't know. I'm just not convinced that. Uh, uh, crypto needs to dumb down the um dumb down the interfaces so much right i don't think we have to get to the point where it, it's essentially it's become like so dumbed down where i mean i don't know if any of, of you guys have ever watched the uh, the movie Idi idiocracy right i actually watched it for the first time a few months ago and in the in the user interfaces that people use within you know wherever they are within society have been dumbed down so much um that basically it's just like the action of like putting a um I guess like a, a block into a into a hole, and that's like the user interface. And there's kind of like a big button on the screen that says yes or no, right? There's no co complexity there. I actually think that's detrimental to the user experience. I think that you shouldn't assume the users are like really, really dumb. But I understand why Web2 companies have done this. They want to make sure that they can make the process as dead simple as possible. But in doing that, I think you lose a lot of the magic of what makes a lot of these things cool and a lot of the innovation that you can do here. Um, and a lot of the kind of like uh, people that you can actually onboard given the right incentives. Because obviously in the Web2 world, there's no money-making incentives or there's very little money-making incentives as opposed, and it's more about like social incentives as opposed to crypto where it's both. It's social and financial. And financial was obviously very powerful here. So if you have like a, a yield farm or if someone hears about a token they want to buy on a specific 
kind of like chain, they're going to jump through the hoops to get there. Like, think about all the people that would have installed MetaMask just to buy the SHIB token when it was pumping because SHIB wasn't available on uh, Coinbase originally and it wasn't available on like, you know, many centralized exchanges. You have to buy it through through a DEX. And then what about all those other kind of like meme coins that were on uh, BSC? BSC was popular for that sort of stuff. People jumped through these hoops because there was money to be made. So do not underestimate the power of incentives. I always tell that to people. It's like the reason why, I mean, I was looking at it the other day. I was looking, I was kind of like, I, I had a suspicion I'm like, okay, you know, uh, the Avalanche C chain, which is an EVM side chain, has gotten a lot of attention lately because it had cheap fees, which it doesn't anymore, funny enough. It actually had got, got like so much usage that the fees have gone up, which is inevitable in, uh, for any chain, by the way. It's just the reason why the fees are low on a lot of these chains is because they don't have enough usage to fill up the blocks yet. But when they do, the fees obviously kind of go higher. And that's why I talk about the modular blockchain design and all that good stuff there. But to get back on topic, I went to DeFi Llama's website and they track the TVL of, of different chains. If you look at every single chain that has done massive incentive programs, such as uh, you know the Avalanche C chain, Phantom, uh, you had the Polygon POS chain earlier in the year, you can see the uptick very clearly. And it's the same for Ethereum layer one, but it just goes back further back to DeFi summer. As soon as the incentives kick in, as soon as there's kind of like yield farming to be had where you can farm tokens and, and sell them off and make make you know relatively easy money, the TVL sky rockets and the thing is is that like you know it, depending on how long the yield farm uh, kind of like lasts it could be it's a lot of mercenary capital it'll, it'll come and go but it actually works to bootstrap a new ecosystem that's why i was talking yesterday about uh little cohen's proposal to get uniswap liquidity mining on layer twos it's just a really nice growth uh growth hack essentially and it works very, very well, if done correctly. I mean, there's plenty of instances where it's worked very poorly, but I think that people really do underestimate, still underestimate how powerful these liquidity incentives are. And I, that's why I'm not surprised to see MetaMask's growth just continue to skyrocket because, as I said, they're the most popular desktop browser wallet. They're the only real one that people can use and kind of like easily change chains and easily kind of manage their assets. I know the UX is like really alien, but I'm sorry, as I said before, I don't think we need to dumb things down to the point where it's like so, so dumb like and, and, and they can like appeal to everyone just yet. We don't, we're not even there yet. Like if it, we're not at the point where we where, uh, we can mass uh, uh, mass on board everyone yet. No no chain is, not, not, nothing in the ecosystem is, not just because of the UX, but also because of the scalability. Uh, I, I've said before, and I'll say it again, eventually uh, the, the fees are going to have to be zero. Now, by zero, I mean zero for the end user. There's still going to be fees on on uh, on these things. There's still going to be fees paid to layer one Ethereum through the layer twos. But long term, if you want mass adoption for any chain, I'm sorry, but like even one cent fees is probably not going to cut it because it depends on the actions people are doing. If people want to use the chain, you know, lots and lots for the day, then it, then it stacks up really quickly. Uh, maybe one cent fee, you know, fees do cut it if it's baked into the actual products, but. I think it's going to be a race to the bottom on fees. And what will end up happening is that there will be fees, but the apps will pay for it out of their kind of like profitability that they've gotten from from kind of like running the rollup, for example, like a DIDX, they're paying the layer one Ethereum fees by using the trading fees that they're taking to, to do that. So I'm, I'm expecting to see a lot of that. But uh, yeah, a little bit of a tangent there, but I thought it was relevant to the discussion of MetaMask users absolutely blowing up. And you know what? If MetaMask was going to do a token, now would be the perfect time to do it because they have so many users. There's so much hype. The market is okay. Like it's not like bullish or bearish right now. It's just like, you know, let's go sideways for a bit, which is actually fine. So I think if they were going to do a token, they would do it now. And unfortunately, I've thought about it for a very long time. The only way they could do an airdrop uh, for MetaMask users would be through the swap feature. And that would actually not be a great distribution. I think it would punish a lot of the older users because the older users and the, and the Ethereum OGs, we don't use the swap feature because it has a 0.8% fee on top of the fee that the AMM already charges. So we just go direct. And, you know, funny enough, that might actually be detrimental to us if we don't get the, you know, as many tokens as other people, which is fine, whatever. I mean, I've been, I've been, well, a lot of us have been spoiled with airdrops lately, but I'm very curious to see about the timing here, especially because consensus just raised a new round. It's going to be interesting to see if... Um, MetaMask does their token soon. I'm expecting it sooner rather than later, but at the same time, uh, I think that they're still trying to figure out a way to distribute it as fairly as possible. That's, I guess, the last thing I saw about it. So uh, Trent Van Epps highlighted a Reddit comment from Froggy Frogstar or Swagnimus Prime on uh, on Reddit today. So you can go to Reddit here and there's this kind of like really, really popular post on Reddit from, uh, I don't know, some random user here. And it's titled, ETH is bad and, I've, and I'm tired of pretending it's not. And I mean, this whole post, wall of text is really like, 
hilariously bad. If you read this as someone who's been here for a while, you will know immediately why. But unfortunately, uh, the cryptocurrency subreddit uh, is is not those kinds of people. Most of them are, are newer people. So they're going to read this and they're automatically going to think it's true because we live in the age of post-truth and no one actually facts checks anything, which is super annoying. Um, as an educator, it's the most annoying thing ever. But Spagnumus Prime jumped in here and basically debunked every single point with links to sources and kind of like, uh, you know, a further explanation about every single point here. So if you did come across this post or if you saw someone link it to you, or if you just want to kind of like see what it looks like to uh, systematically destroy FUD, this is amazing. Because I used to do this a lot as well um, on, on Twitter, especially not, not not really on Reddit, on Twitter. And Ether was born out of this sort of stuff. So it's really great to see other people like Spagnumus Spagnum Prime here taking on board uh, kind of like the taking, I guess, like the torch, right? And, and carrying it head forward and debunking this because if he didn't do it, who else? Who else would have done it in this post? And, you know, his post, I mean, the original post got almost 10,000 upvotes. His post got uh, almost 5,000. But unfortunately, the way the internet works, we all know the parent post is going to see the most amount of views by order to magnitude and the comments are not going to see as many views. But still, it's worthwhile doing this. Uh, I think we're, the Ethereum community is extremely lucky to have people like Spagnumus in it to basically debunk all of this FUD. And I'm not even going to go through it. You can read through it yourself, but it is some of the worst FUD I've ever seen in terms of like how stupid it is. It's full of conspiracy theories. It seems like this person is an XRP bag holder, just kind of like salty about the fact that um, XRP was uh, kind of like, uh, not, I don't think it was officially classified as a security, but like the SEC went after Ripple uh, and stuff like that. But also... You know, talking about how, like, uh, you know, obviously the, you know, uh, the kind of like proof of stake that, uh, and how that's more centralized in the proof of work and stuff like that. Funny enough, I don't think that they mentioned anything about gas fees in here, which is probably strategic on their part uh, because everyone talks about high gas fees these days and there's just really no point bringing it up anymore. Um, but yeah, give this a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description. Just wanted to highlight that there for you. So Polygon has announced that they're donating one, donating $1 million to Gitcoin to help fund open source projects. Man, this is amazing. Like the next Gitcoin grants round, which is December something uh, matching round, is going to be huge. Absolutely massive. It's going to be bigger than the last round, which is already big. We have millions of dollars coming in for public goods. I went over it yesterday how the, um, the Ethereum Foundation donated $500,000 to Gitcoin. They're going to be doing a... Um, a different round. I think it's going to be separate to the normal Gitcoin grants matching round. But I mean, it's just amazing to see the amount of money pouring into public goods. We've had obviously the Ethereum Foundation do it. Uh, we've had kind of Polygon do it. We've had Optimism do it, uh, where they're basically saying all their profit from their, their layer two sequencer is going towards public goods, which got paid out recently. We have the EF uh, ecosystem support program generally. I mean, there's so many initiatives out there. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, and, there's, and there's kind of like more being spun up in the background, I think, as well, that is going to be coming out soon. Um, there's some stuff that I'm going to be doing soon for public goods. It's just a little bit of an alpha leak there. That's coming out soon. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 see, I see nothing negative about this sort of stuff. I see it basically as the community or the wider kind of like uh, crypto ecosystem giving back to the infrastructure that we all take for granted, really. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we use is is free. I mean, uh, and, and a lot of the stuff that we use is maintained by just like a very core group of people who are definitely not paid enough. Uh, like the Ethereum core developers, for example, they should be paid way more than they are. But the problem is, is that when you see kind of like core developers of many maybe other chains, they have like stock options or kind of like token options that they that they that vest out to them. Now, Ethereum can't do that because Ethereum already did its ICO in 2014. It's already issued tokens. The token price has already gone up a lot uh, uh, since then. And the Ethereum Foundation can't print more ETH. They can just pay out bonuses in ETH, of course, and all that sort of stuff. But still, the upside is probably less than going and kind of like joining some random team. And if the token pumps, you get more. But at the same time, as I've explained before, a lot of, uh, especially Ethereum core developers, they're not just in it for the money, right? I mean, yes, money's important, but they're in it for the mission and they've really bought into doing this stuff. They want to change the world. I mean, the amount of Ethereum core developers that are super excited about the merge right now, you can't do the merge on other chains. You can't work on on sharding on, on, on most other chains. You can't, you know, work, uh, work with like such a, uh, a, a strong community and, and all that sort of stuff, right? You can't buy that. Um, but at the same time, we do want to get as much money to them as possible just to make sure that they feel valued. Not because maybe they need it or they want to go buy a Lambo or something. It's never about that when it comes to money, at least from my point of view. What it's about is simply valuing these people as they should be valued because va I'm a firm believer in that you that the world should, you know, it doesn't, it, most of the time it doesn't work like this, unfortunately, but I'm a firm believer in, in kind of like 
I guess like tuning, fine tuning the world so that the we can kind of like give back to the uh, to people who put in a lot of value, that, you know, almost the same amount as they put in essentially. So if these core developers are maintaining a five hundred billion dollar Ethereum network and they're kind of like building critical kind of upgrades that are actually going to increase the price of ETH over time, then one, they should be given ETH, right? And they should be given it in various ways. It could be vested over time. There's a few initiatives going on for that, but generally they should be given ETH as a bonus, especially from from their employer and, and things like that, if that's possible. Um, um, but two, the community should, should just shower them with money um, because we want them to feel as valued as possible. We want them to stay within the ecosystem. We don't want to lose them to to kind of like other teams. And you know, the, the thing is, is that in, in an industry like this, where not only is the industry struggling to find enough people to to hire for all the different kind of like project teams, but the core developers. I mean, the core developer role is not a role that uh, just anyone can do. It, it requires a very very specialized kind of. Um, a set of skills and set of knowledge. It requires people to kind of like want to work uh, as a core developer. I mean, that's it's it's, it's a high stress kind of environment as well. Um, but the payoff is really a, more of a social payoff than a monetary payoff, at least for Ethereum, um, and and more of a kind of like payoff of yes, you are kind of like changing the world with this technology. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we should just stand by and say, okay, well, yes, these people are uh, probably you know paid a lot as a salary uh, as a, on a salary basis, but they should share in the upside of ETH as well if their contributions to the Ethereum network work cause the ETH price to go up right over the long term of course then they should be getting ETH for their for their work and they should be able to get it and it should be vested and they should be able to hold it and and they should be able to kind of like ride up that wave just like all of us have ridden it up if we bought ETH early on I mean I wrote it up I tried to give back as much as possible but to be honest, I think the core developers have done much more than I have for for the Ethereum ecosystem in terms of like uh, uh, making sure that uh, the upgrades are going through, making sure things like one five five nine happen, making sure that the Ethereum network doesn't blow itself up. I mean, th those things it's a, it's a thankless job. People just do not talk about it enough, and uh, I think that they're just like the the unsung heroes of Ethereum. So very much uh, in favor of uh, I guess like any teams and any projects donating as much money as possible to public goods, whether that be core development or something else, just anything that classified as public classifies as public goods and that helps the wider crypto and ethereum ecosystems so starkware has announced that starknet alpha 4 is now out which in and this release is going to be the one that will be deployed to mainnet so you can read more details about it here on their blog post but basically what's new is token bridges block caches and a few more features as you can read about in here so this is more i guess like developer oriented um and, and not, not you know the, the, the update's not very detailed beyond that but of course you can check out kind of like code examples and stuff on their website. But essentially, as I said, this is the mainnet release candidate. Now, I've said before that I think that StarkNet Alpha is going to be late November. I didn't think it was going to be early or mid-November. We're at 18th of November now. So either next week or the week after, we should see it on mainnet. Now, I do want to caution people here that just because the StarkNet Alpha is going to mainnet doesn't mean that suddenly everyone is going to have their apps on there and everything's going to be dandy and everything's going to you know have like a massive kind of uh, network effect and growth. It's going to take time. I think it's actually going to take more than uh, a few months. I mean, rollups, uh, optimistic rollups have already taken longer than a few months. It's been since August with Arbitrum. I mean, Arbitrum and Optimism are obviously growing, but it's just like a slow burn. It's not like a, uh, until they do tokens, of course, because then it can go crazy. But it's not like a, you know, Starknet's going to get to to mainnet and then everyone's going to suddenly build on that. Everyone's going to move there and everything's going to be dandy and Starknet's going to have like, you know, billions and billions of TVL. It's not going to happen like that. Uh, but the thing is, there are apps that are already kind of like running on Starkware's technology that can connect into Starknet, not in the initial release, but, you know, later on down the line, such as Immutable X and DYDX and, and So Rare and all the other kind of things building on Starkware's technology. Diversify, of course. Um, so, so yeah, super exciting to, to see that. Uh, and I can't wait to see this on mainnet. So as I've been speaking a lot about uh, Uniswap's new 0.01% fee tier for stablecoin swaps. And I guess I'm talking about it again today because Hayden Adams from Uniswap put out an update saying uh, since uh, I guess like the last update, the 0.01% uh, fee tier, tier was turned on. Uniswap V3 has gone from 10% of one inches USDC to USDT volume to 96%. That is crazy. Look at this chart. The purple uh, kind of um, uh, bar here is Uniswap V3. You can see just a few days ago where before the 0.01% fee was switched on, I think that's November 13th, maybe um, it was basically maybe 10% as, oh yeah, yeah it's about 10% as, um, as Hayden said here, then increased, increased again, slightly decreased and then boom, massive increase. And, you know, I, I think like the best comparison 
would obviously be curve here. And you can see curve uh, is, is basically this, uh, what is this, this kind of like blue purple. I mean, it's it looks like the same color. It's kind of hard to distinguish between uh, between these things, but I guess that's curve V1. Where's curve V2? Maybe I'm blind right now, but um, I mean, the curve's not really going to be much there, right? <laughs> I think uh, when you when you kind of look at it like that, it basically means that uh, maybe there's more information here. Yeah, you can see here curve V1's 3.5%, but what about curve V2? Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at that more closely, but uh, it's safe to say that uh, Unisop is extremely competitive now, especially because, as I've explained before, stablecoin swaps are a race to the bottom in terms of fees, guys. Like, I strongly believe that. There is no reason why it isn't going to be like that. So, I mean, Unisop doing this is going to force Curve to react to this, uh, and it's also going to force them... Uh, to kind of like not just react, but also try and uh, try and innovate beyond fees too. Because as you know, fees, I mean, race to the bottom, it basically means that Unisop and Curve may actually just have the same fees. And then from then on, it becomes uh, a matter of like integrations and, and, and marketing and brand awareness, business development, all that sort of stuff. And I think Unisop has a better lead there than Curve um, just because it's much more well-known. So we'll have to see. Not to say I'm bearish on Curve or anything like that. It's a great team, great product. But at the same time, I don't know, guys. Like, uh, I don't. I don't see where Curve's moat is if their fees are higher than Uniswap's because Uniswap basically already has a massive moat. They've lowered the fees for stablecoin swaps, so we'll have to see. I mean, Curve obviously has like pools that aren't just two assets. They have like tri pools and and bigger pools than that, and they have some other pools out there. So they're not like kind of like uh, out of the out of the race or anything. But they're going to have to react to this for sure. I believe. So Nifty Island is teasing a bunch of new NFTs that they're going to be doing as a pre-launch gift to their community. So these are called the Legendary Pistols, which is a kind of like a series of NFTs. I think there's 10,000 pistols, metaverse ready and primed for in-game utility. All but 10 will be given away as a gift to the community. And then 10, I assume, are going to be kind of like sold off here. So this is amazing. I mean, as a early Nifty Island community member and as a palm holder and as a blade holder as well. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, apparently, I'll be getting airdropped one of these bad boys, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, but again, this goes back to what I was saying yesterday about permanence. Normally, when you get airdropped an item in a, in a video game, as I explained yesterday, it's like centralized, so there's no permanence there. But with this, total permanence. I have total control over it because it's an NFT. Um, you know, the JPEG itself, of course, like depends where that's stored, but that can be easily stored on Rweave or IPFS or anything like that. Um, and I can store it locally myself as well. But I mean, that just brings total permanence to it. So I'm very, very excited for this. Now, I might bid on one of the one of the ten. We'll see how I go there, but uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. I'm very much looking forward to Nifty Islands uh, kind of like race as well because they they said here that this is the final kind of like gift uh, and final NFT drop, um, and it'll be the last drop before oh, sorry the last drop before Nifty Islands beta launch. So looks like their beta launch is happening. Uh, the raffle's happening on the first of December. So it looks like their uh, it's kind of like a series of raffles here. But basically, um, looks like their beta might be happening in December or. January. So very much looking forward to playing around with Nifty Island in beta. Speaking of NFTs, Seb from Zappa uh, put, uh, kind of like showcased a little teaser here about Zappa's new NFT integration. Obviously, it has uh, been lacking lately. I mean, it's not obviously not like the, the, the central place people go to, but I think they're trying to really rectify that. They, you know, you can see here they've got like trending collections, top sales. You can see top collection, uh, top collections with like, um, I guess like volume, floor price, all that good stuff there. Activity. I mean, yeah, it seems like they're making it a much more social experience and trying to go toe to toe with kind of other NFT interfaces, which there aren't actually many. I personally use uh, uh, OpenSea to look at my NFTs right now. Zappa has this issue where uh, the, it'll show you a price of the NFT that is like, you know, totally incorrect. And when I look at it, I'm just like, hmm, yes, that's not correct. My random NFT is not worth a million dollars. And I don't know where that kind of like price comes from. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they're going to fix that with this. So really cool to see this little sneak peek here of their new NFT interface. Uh, Diversify is launching a new reward slash liquidity mining program on December 1st. Uh, you'll be able to liquidity provide in 16 new incentivized pools and earn DVF tokens. So you can read this blog post for more details about this. But, you know, D Diversify, for those who don't know, is a layer 2 exchange. They're built using StarQuest technology. They're a, uh, they're a Validium technically, but they're built using StarQuest, Starquest technology and they have an AMM and they also have a CLOB as well. So uh, I think this is going to lead to some really awesome growth for them. I know that uh, Loop Ring as a kind of like exchange, uh, layer two exchange has also done liquidity mining in the past and it really does work to bootstrap the growth as I've explained before. So very much looking forward to this. If you want to get involved, definitely check out the blog post for more details here. 
All right, now I'm going to talk a bit about this because someone mentioned it in the Discord channel and I've been seeing people talk about this uh, and I haven't covered it yet. Constitution DAO. All right, I'm sure you've all heard about it by now, but for those of you who haven't, what Constitution DAO is doing is that they're raising a bunch of money to buy a copy of the US uh, kind of like Constitution from uh, Sotheby's, which is, which is the auction house, of course, which is happening, I think, today, the auction. So, so far, they have raised over $40 million in ETH to buy this thing crazy. I mean, this thing is actually really rare. It's one of 13 original copies of the US Constitution. So obviously it is a big deal. But I think beyond that, there's a deeper meaning here. There's a deeper kind of thing that we can look into here that I wrote about in the newsletter. And that's essentially this DAO was formed in the last few days and managed to raise over $40 million from anyone in the world. This is the true power of DAOs. Not only are DAOs good for amazing social coordination, global social coordination, but they are good for global financial capital uh, formation. Because when you think about it, let's take um, doing a ra uh, kind of like fundraise or a DAO, kind of like a crowd raise, like uh, Constitution DAO. Let's take an example of doing it in Ethereum versus doing it in traditional finance. Well, I just explained to you what it looks like in, in Ethereum land, right? It's very, very easy to do um, and it can be done really quickly. In traditional finance, you know what would happen with this? It would get censored. The, tr the, the centralized payment processes would basically shut them down before they even got off the ground. They'd be like, you're running it because, because uh, also because people are getting a token for doing this to govern the, the constitution DAO. But essentially, the centralized payment processes will be like, well, this is too risky. You're running an unregistered security offerings. We're shutting you down and reporting you to the SEC. See you later. And they freeze the funds, right? Um, and then you have to go through this long and arduous process to get your funds back and nothing gets off the ground. Now, let's assume for a moment they don't censor this and they don't stop it from happening. There are other crowd of crowd, crowd funds that have been fine in the past, like um, Kickstarter, of course, and and uh, Indiegogo and all that sort of stuff. And they've worked quite well for, for a long time. Eh, quite well. I would say like 90% of the stuff funded on there, maybe, maybe more than that, just ends up going to zero and doesn't actually do anything. Uh, kind of like ICOs. Um, but essentially what Constitution DAO allows, it, uh, allows for on Ethereum is is uncensorable, decentralized, global capital formation with social coordination on top of it, with a DAO on top of it, with a token to manage that DAO and being able to bid on a real world item by doing this. Now, of course, there's trust here. The multi-sig that holds these funds is consisting of 13 people. They're, I think all of them are known or at least most of them are known. So if there was a rug that happened, you could probably go after them. But, you know, there's still a risk there. It is a, thir you know, 13 uh, multi-sig holder. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a 10 of 13 or something like that, or maybe a 7 of 13, but there are currently 13 multi-sig account. Uh, it's a 13 multi-sig right now. Um, so from that point of view, yes, there is still risk there. It's like get rugged by the multi-sig holders instead of getting rugged by PayPal, right? For example. But in saying that, it is still much better than the uh, existing system, like a thousand times better. And the fact that they were able to raise for something brand new, by the way, this is not something that kind of like was already well known. This just came out of nowhere and people like talked about it. Uh, it was all organic marketing all over Twitter. There's no kind of like insiders. There's no pre-sale. There's nothing. There's, there's no tokens being given to people to promote this. It really is like a totally fair launch where you just throw in money once uh, that, you know, if they do win the kind of like constitution, they will uh, issue the token, which I think the token might be called people or something like that. Um, I saw people sending me people tokens to my sassel.eth address because they're trying to scam people, of course. So I'm just assuming that it's going to be called people, but uh, there is not a token right now. So please don't go looking for a token to ape into. It doesn't exist right now. Um, but, you know, if they do kind of like win it, they're going to issue the token and then the, the DAO will be able to kind of manage various assets aspects of it, like where this will be displayed, um, kind of like, um, uh, I think there's a few more details on the website, but basically the main one they were focusing on is like, you know, where it's going to be displayed, uh, kind of like who's going to steward it, who's going to, you know, the multi stick holders, all that sort of stuff there. So that's super exciting. That's something that you can't do at all in traditional finance. Even if you aren't censored, you you really not, you can't practically do that. You can't form a DAO, like a worldwide DAO that anyone can participate in. You can't uh, issue a token. I mean, you can do... I mean, the thing is you can actually do this in like the real world, for example, but it is so impractical. It doesn't make any sense to do it because you need legal paperwork. You need lawyers to look at it for it to be legally bonding. You need to be able to track everything. It's just a crazy amount of complexity and a crazy amount of overhead and, and like so much cost involved. Whereas on Ethereum, you issue an ERC-20 token, the token is governed by the smart contract. The DAO is governed by the smart contract, which is governed by the token holders and you are all well and good. You know, the NFTs are owned by the DAO 
uh, sorry, not the NFT. The constitution is owned by the DAO. The physical object still requires, you know, stewardship, still requires kind of like securing and all that sort of stuff there. But the kind of like NFT is, you know, belonging to the DAO and, and things like that. So, so yeah, my opinion on this is a, like a super cool idea. I really like what they're doing. I know that there's been a bit of skepticism about this. Where people are like, you know, I don't understand what this is. Like, why are people throwing so much money at this? And I would really say that the excitement comes from people being able to show off the power of Ethereum as a social and financial capital kind of like a coordination mechanism. And also it's just something to get involved with as community members of Ethereum. It's just something to have fun with. It's something to make memes about. Like this is meme, WAG BTC, or hashtag WAG BTC, which stands for we are gonna buy the constitution. That's genius because obviously you have BTC in there, right? It's a nod to BTC as well. Um, and, and, you know, you got like this uh, parchment, parchment, which is uh, kind of taken from Olympus Dow, which is like 3-3, which is basically um, saying that we should all work together to do something um, because it's in everyone's best interest to do that. So, yeah, I mean, I just thought this was very fascinating. I know I hadn't covered it yet, but I was actually waiting until it was kind of like confirmed, confirmed that it was legit. I didn't want to talk about it if it turned out to be a scam. It seems legit, but as I said, the multi-sig is 13. Uh, holders right now so they could rug if they wanted to but I don't think that's going to happen um, from what I've seen but don't quote me on that if it does happen um, please don't you know <laughs> don't quote me on that but if you want to put money into this it's your choice I haven't personally done so um, but yeah just be, be aware of that um, and also be aware of any scam tokens guys there's no token for this project yet please do not buy it I'm getting spammed every day with people meta shib all these tokens like get it get, stop <laughs> uh, you know i have notifications on from my sassel.eth address from etherscan i should turn those off because it's just getting annoying now um but anyway end rant there i got a couple other things to get through before i end this uh for today so just a quick one here adidas is issuing a poap so for those of you who don't know i mean poap I mean, I'm, I'm not even gonna, gonna say that. Everyone should know Pop by now. It's basically a way to collect unique uh, NFTs, unique badges as like, and, and Pop stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol. And basically these like unique rare things that you can only get for attending like an online event or attending a special kind of launch or attending an offline event or something like that. So Adidas have actually uh, created one and you can see it's basically the Adidas logo here with kind of like a 2021 uh, uh, background kind of like a cascading there. Uh, this is awesome. I mean, I love the fact that these traditional brands are getting more and more involved with crypto. And I love the fact that they're getting more and more involved with Ethereum kind of like native uh, darling projects like Poap because at the end of the day, it's all about the culture and the community. And it seems Adidas uh, gets that, which I really, really love. So yeah, really cool to see that. And the final thing here was just a shout out that the Ethereum.org team is hiring a product designer. So if you want to own the full design lifecycle of your web uh, of um, Ethereum.org's web products and collaborate closely with their small team and engineering, uh, small product and engineering teams, then apply to this role. You can go to the website here. Uh, it's a link. It links directly to product designer at Ethereum.org. Um, you can apply it for the job. Click the button here, and it'll show like all the skills that you need and, and everything. And, he, and here's kind of like the estimated salary as well, 95K to 135K, US dollars, of course. Uh, and I think this is, re yeah, remote as well. So, you know, I can't think of like a, 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 a more awesome job. I mean, obviously there's a lot of awesome jobs out, out there, but this is you know, definitely one that I would uh, would be very interested in if I was a, a product designer because the Ethereum.org website has come such a long way. It's such an amazing website. I mean, just looking at it in front of me, look at all this art. I love this. I love this stuff so much. It looks so cool and you get to be involved in this. So definitely go check this out. I will link it in the YouTube description, but I'm going to end it there. So Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.